The book of Acts, chapter 6 and 7. The book of the church, centuries ago. And the church today. Not so different. Maybe much alike. There's a couple themes that kind of come to the surface from those passages of Scripture. The first theme is commitment. You see, they don't get to the end of the chapter all of a sudden. The end comes gradually because of the commitment. Oh, that tiny word, commitment. For some, it's easy. For others, it's difficult, depending upon what it is. What are you asking? If you're in college and somebody says, Hey, would you like to go to pizza tomorrow night? I'm buying. The answer is, count me in. How about we go for ice cream? Your favorite kind, again, I'm buying. How many want to come? Count me what? Count me in. It's easy to make some commitments, isn't it? And it's difficult to make other commitments. I don't know where you are at on that range of continuums. I'm going to let the Holy Spirit figure that out. And if he prods you, if he pushes you, if you feel a tinge in a movement today, you take it up with him. The art of commitment, or or commitment comes in many different levels. You see, when I go to the 99 cent store, I go in there thinking it's going to be a $2 purchase. And pretty soon, it's not the 99 cent store, it's the $24.95 store. Because I just can't say no to that. I don't have that widget that's going to break the first time I use it in the garage yet. And in it goes. It's not much of a commitment. I can do that. The easy things I can commit to. Now ask me a more complicated commitment. Like, okay, what kind of car do you want to buy? Well, that's going to take me more than a few days. I will scan websites and spend probably several weeks nuancing what size wheels, what engines. You know how it works, guys, don't you? Yeah, it's all important. (laughs) Now, ladies, let's see. When you make decisions, where shall we go for vacation? And you have it all laid out because you sat at the computer. And you present it to your husband, something like this. Dear, weren't you thinking about vacation this year? After you fix him a wonderful meal. (laughs) And you feed him his best dessert. Wouldn't it be wonderful to think about this? And the lights slowly come on. And he gets some of those pieces put together. Commitment. There are small commitments. There are large commitments. There are temporary commitments. There are longer commitments. There are, there are short commitments. There are eternal commitments. How easy is it for you to make commitments? You see, commitment, the word commitment itself, has changed down through the decades. Do you believe that? Let me give you an example. Uh, long, long before, <clears throat> long before telephones, long before, let me go, <laughs> let me, let me start where we're at. Long before cell phones, there were these old things called telephones. Now the telephones came in many versions. There was touch tone, and before that there were rotary phones, and before that there were party lines, and before that there were crank phones. Now I've seen the crank phones. I was not the generation uh, of the crank phone. I was the generation of the party line. 
that you could listen in to find out what's going on in the neighbor's house if you weren't, uh, if you were that interested. There wasn't much else on TV that was black and white, except two channels that came in snowy. Those were the days that people actually talked to each other. And those were the days that if you made a commitment to go over to a neighbor's house at 7 o'clock, guess what? You showed up! 7 o'clock! And if you made a commitment to help a neighbor if you were a farmer, you did. You carried it out. Somewhere along the lines, uh, long, before, uh, long before the advent of the airplane and the rocket plane and landing on the moon, a commitment meant, I am going to do something, and I mean it. Hmm. Maybe not so much so these days. Do you know what I mean? When it seems to me, sort of, I don't know that this is the case with you, it seems to me, sort of, that today, when you have 140 spaces in text messaging, when you say, yes, I'll do that, it means something like this. Yes, I'll do that if I don't get a better offer. Or I don't find a reason that I can give that is socially acceptable not to carry it out. Or I'm not feeling like it. You can be my friend on Facebook until you nuance something, and then with a click of a mouse, you're no longer my what? Friend. Hmm. How does that work? A click, you're in. A click, you're out. Sounds like a deep commitment, doesn't it? What's happened to commitment? And what's it all about? I want to share with you just a couple of thoughts. There is an article called The Lost Art of Commitment, 2010, Chuck Colson. Certain characteristics are so inherent to Christianity, he says, that to neglect them is to become a walking oxymoron. A Christian without commitment is such an oxymoron. That's why I was so disturbed when a friend shared a statement when he attended a Christian college. When asked, what has changed most in the past 20 years with young people entering college? All of them said that young adults today are far, <clears throat> are far less willing to commit. Whether we're talking about career, marriage, or faith, or studies, uh, studies back up their observation in 2008. Now mind you, uh, that's eight years ago, 2008, more than half of the people ages 10 to 24 had been in their current employer for less than a year. Although the recession has dampened this somewhat, young adults are still floundering when it comes to embracing a calling. Marriage, express, ex, marriage especially has suffered according to the U.S. data, uh, U.S. census data. Young adults are marrying later, Generation Next gave some in insight as to why the desire for adventure, career advancement, and prolonged adolescence, the lack of commitment, is also hitting in religions. Studies suggest that the iPod generation is coming up with their own brand of religion. They just click from this piece of religion that they like and click from that piece of religion. They copy and paste, copy and paste, copy and paste until they have their own. Custom designed. The basic building blocks of society simply erode without commitment. Any sensible society must address the problem by educating people that commitment is the very essence of human relationships. Did you catch that? Commitment is the very essence of human relationships. We as people need structure in our life. We as people need commitment one to another. We need to teach us in our churches. How can we, be, how can we begin as a Christian without death to self and total commitment to Christ Jesus? So I'm going to ask you today, 
How is your commitment in three areas? Commitment to a place, a place where you find God. A place called, and a place, and that's all it is, church. How is your commitment to people, the people of God? And how is your commitment to the purpose of God? For you see, commitment is vital if we're going to grow in our relationship with God. But more, more than that, we are hardwired, scientists tell us, that biologically, in our brains, we are wired to desire to make commitment, to find meaning through relationships. One of the renowned medical schools, uh, the YMCA of USA Dartmouth Medical School Institute for American Val Values 2003, uh, did a study and called it Hardwired to Connect, the New Scientific Case for Authoritative Communities, a report to the nation from the Commission on Children at Risk, 82 pages in length, if you want to reference it online sometime. I'm just going to touch on a couple of highlights because I believe, I believe that it shares with us the inherent need to ask commitment from one another and, and commitment from our children to model what commitment is all about. You see, in the, there were two crises leading to the study. Um, the first was that more and more young people are suffering from mental illness, emotional distress, and behavioral problems. Let's call this aspect of the crisis epidemiological. Patterns and causes of disease and sickness among our youth. The second part of the crisis is intellectual. It concerns failures of understanding, our inability as a society to respond effectively to these deteriorations in childhood and adolescence in their well-being, in raising them. Leading experts, 33-member commission in American Values noted, authoritative, authoritative communities are needed because children are hard wired to seek structure and meaning and commitment in their lives. Do you believe that, friends? We as a society have become so politically correct and so removed from training, it's almost difficult to tell a child, no, that's not how you go about it. It's wrong to do that. You just figure it out for yourself until you have a 40-year-old who's still trying to figure it out. Have you met them? I have met 70-year-old adolescents. That'll catch up with you Tuesday. <laughs> then again, I have met 12-year-old adults. The difference is in the training, because God has given us, God has given all of us minds and lives that desire commitment to Him. Do you believe that, friends? And when there's a lack of commitment, there's a lack of direction. It's like a ship on an ocean without a rudder. There may be winds blowing it, but it's drifting every which way. Finding trouble in growing statistics as to stress, anxiety, conduct disorders, depression, suicide, and other behavioral and mental dif difficulties among U.S. children and youth. The commission asked two critical questions. What's causing this rise in distress and dysfunction in the youth? What can be done about it? And the report gives three major goals and 18 recommendations, of which I will not read all of them. To, uh, for the sick, scarcity of time. But let me touch on just a few. There's two, uh, there's two, uh, two critical pieces. One is 
the home and family in rearing children for the Lord. Teach them to make age, <clears throat> teach them to make age appropriate commitments. For it's appropriate to ask your child to make a commitment to come to family worship. It's appropriate to say, as long as we live in this home together, uh, we're going to spend time talking to Jesus. I don't want to. Well, you know what? Sometimes you don't want to eat. Um, it's time to eat. I don't want to. You don't want to break the will of a child. You want to mold and gently bend and train. You know how that works? That works something like this. Entice them by example. Tell them the stories of how God has led in your life. Encourage them to tell you the stories about how God is working in their lives. No matter how small it seems, come alongside them and share what Christianity is all about. The biological hardwiring is discerned and primed, is increasingly discernible in the basic structure of the brain, that nurturing environments that affect gene transcription in the development of the brain circuitry. The second, that the old nurture and nurture debate is no longer relevant, that adolescent risk-taking and novelty-seeking are connected to changes in the brain. It's going to happen. Your children are going to grow up and question what life is all about. You better have those conversations with them and help them have a safe environment to make, to make commitments. That assigning meaning to gender in childhood and adolescence is a human and is universal. That deeply influences well-being. It's all right to tell a boy he's a boy. It's all right to tell a girl she's a girl. These are deep, deep influences in the family. These are the first six, six planks, and the second four planks all reinforce the idea that morality and spirituality are biologically primed and fostered or neglected through the attachment of authoritative communities. Do you like that word, authoritative communities? I did not say authoritarian communities, did I? Oh, catch the difference there. Don't just nuance it. Make sure you fully understand it. For it's one thing to say, by the authority of Scripture, these are certain guidelines for your life. It's another to say, I've been watching you. And by the authority of God, you better straighten up or I know where you're going. God's word has its place as authority in my life and as an authority in your life. Do you believe that to be true? Amen. But as we start to embrace and become that authorita authoritative community, we must first embrace it for ourselves. We must first examine our lives to see where are the areas in our lives where we're committed to living out fully what it means to be a Christian in our homes and in our church and in our community? For you see, that authority was what was modeled in the book of Acts. Do you see it there, friends? The ideal authori authoritative community exhibits characteristics of a social institution. It includes children and youth. The second, it sees children and youth as ends in themselves. It is warm and nurturing group. It exhibits clear boundaries and limits. It has limits. It is comprised and structured, at least partly by non-specialists. It means you don't have to have a doctor's degree to understand Christianity. It's multi-generation. It is a community that has a long-term focus. It encourages spiritual and religious involvement and development. And it reflects and transmits a shared understanding 
of what a good person is. It's committed to the equality and dignity of all persons in loving one's neighbor. Would you like to be part of a community like that? Move me in. Count me in. I'm committed to that type of community. Sign me up. How about you? How about you? How about you? Are you willing to make that commitment? For you see, not only do adolescents and children need an authoritative community, not an authoritarian community, adults do too, don't we? We need somebody to come alongside of us when we're having a tough day. We need prayer partners who will lift us up. We need those around us that when we have wandered from Christ, will step into the middle space, take their hand and put it in Christ's hands, and their other hand reach out and put it in our hand to be that connecting, uh, that connecting link. Those are the types of relationships that Christ wants us to commit to. Well, let's go to the book of Acts just for a couple of minutes to see how this all plays out. Acts chapter, uh, chapter 6. We find there the story, of, the story of commitment. We find there the early church so busy uh, the pressing on, and demands that they appointed seven deacons to be responsible for the church. And they asked them to be committed to take care of the things in the church. And Stephan, in verse 5, says, um, they chose Stephan and his characteristics. He was a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. Do you like that description? A man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. Have you seen that type a person in your life, somebody who just seems to be filled with the Holy Ghost, somebody who just seems to be walking and so full of faith. Those are the types of people that I like to seek out. How about you, friends? I'm glad that they made a commitment to walk with Jesus, but I also know that I want to be that type of person. How about you? First comes the commitment. First comes the acknowledgement. First comes the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Then comes a person whose life is full of faith. In verse 8, and Stephen again in the in description, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Here is Stephen, as he's full of faith and full of the Holy Ghost, doing great wonders, not drawing attention to himself, but drawing attention to the power of God doing wonders and miracles among God's people. First, the commitment, as he committed his, uh, as he committed his heart and life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Then came, first the commitment, then came the second part, commitment and what? It's the other part. First part's commitment. Second part is, well, you saw it in your bulletin, didn't you? Courage. So let me ask you today, how courageous are you? When I think of the life of Stephen, I see his commitment came first. And day by day, that commitment deepened and deepened and deepened until he was preaching one day and the scribes and the Pharisees took exception when they heard the gospel proclaimed. Verse 54 says, And when they heard these things, they were cut to their heart, and they gnashed on him with, with their teeth. But he, being full, full of the Holy Ghost, 
looked up steadfastly to heaven and saw the glory of God in Jesus standing on the right hand of God. That's the place to be, isn't it, friends? Commitment takes you closer and closer and closer and closer to the Lord Jesus Christ. So that no matter where you are, no matter what difficulty you find yourself in, you can look towards heaven, and it's as if the heavens are open, and you see Jesus standing there. That's where I want to be. How about you, friends? You'll never get there without the first commitment. How is it in your life? Are you one of the commitment phobes uh, pho that has a phobia about commitment? Wait a minute, all of my commitments, whenever I've committed, I've broken them. They turn sorrow. Get over it. You serve a God of commitment. Committed His Son to go to the cross. And if Christ can go to the cross, you can go to Him. And when you make that commitment, to be filled with His Spirit, no matter where you are, no matter what you're facing, and no matter what is going on, the full power of God will be manifest in your life. There is nothing that the gates of hell can prevail against you, but God will be present in your life, and that's the place to be. What do you say, church? But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand and said, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then he cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and they ran upon him with one accord. It doesn't end well for Stephen, does it? It doesn't end well for him, does it? And they cast him out of the city, and they stoned him. And the witnesses lay down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, and they stoned Stephen as he was calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he knelt down and with a loud voice cried, Lord, Lay not this sin at their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Courage follows commitment. He could never have reached that place of full dependence on God unless he had fully committed his life to Christ. I find it interesting. It's not a story of tragedy. It's a story of victory. That commitment to the Lord, he is always with us. That a courageous act, is not so courageous, but just another step of being faithful to Christ. Now I want to be Stephen's neighbor in heaven. How about you, friends? Because here's why. I want to have his commitment to be full of the Spirit, to be so in tune with the Lord, that wherever I go, my feeble, defective character can be overruled by the Spirit of God. And here's why I want to be his neighbor in heaven. Here's why. One day I'm going to knock on his door. I'm going to say, hey, come on a walk with me. We're going to walk down. We're going to knock on another door. Name on the door is Saul, a.k.a. Paul. Paul. Knock on that door, and I'm going, to see, I'm going to see the look on Stephen's face. As he, see, as he sees the most bitter persecutor, perse, persecutors of Christians, as they laid his garments at his feet, Stephen's testimony went forward to have a profound effect. 
You see, the gospel doesn't end. The influence doesn't stop when we draw our last breath. It goes on to the hearts and lives that you have touched, of those who have observed you for good and for bad. I choose good. I'll let, take, I'll let God take care of the other. How about you, friends? First comes the commitment. Then comes the courage. So I ask you today, where's your commitment? In three areas. Where's your commitment in the area of place? where you find God on a regular basis to come into His presence? Where's your commitment to be close to the people of God, your brothers and sisters in Christ, your family members in your home, your co-workers at work? Where's your commitment to the purpose of God? To carry His, to carry his love to everyone you come in contact with. For with that commitment will come the courage and the church will move forward today as it did in the book of Acts. Amen. So, the C word is so intimidating. We run from it, we hide from it, we embrace it when it's something we want. But it's something that God asks us. Commit thyself to me, and I will be with you. I will guide your ways. I will fill you with my spirit. My promises are sure. They go through to the end. Let us pray together. Father, as we come before your throne of grace today, Lord, we walk with you. We've walked with you for many days, many weeks, many years. We believe at times, Father, we have deep commitment that will never wander from the path. But Father, there are areas and circumstances in our lives. There are shadows in our lives. There are corners of our lives that we have yet to fully yield to you. And Father, as we come before your throne of grace, we just ask that you will accept us anew today, that we will open our lives fully to you, that all of our lives will be committed as we become before your throne of grace, that we will be committed to you, to one another, and to your purpose that you will fill us with your spirit, that you will help us to be courageous as we share your amazing love with each person that we come in contact with. Bless us, Father. Keep us in the hollow of your hand in the center of your will. I ask in Christ's precious name. Amen.